I'd like to welcome you to the second part of my tour of the uh, River Hogsmill. And for a bit of recap, the River Hogsmill is a chalk river. It starts in Newell, E-W-E-L-L, -L, which is a Saxon for Saxon name for spring. And it, it's, so it's a chalk stream and it merges at the base of the North Downs in Newell. And it goes only for six miles to Kingston on the River Thames where the Saxon kings were crowned. You can see the clay here, very muddy, uh, particularly after rains. However, although it does flow through the clay for most of its length, because it's a chalk stream, the water is still clear. I mean, there's been lots of rain and I'm literally just standing to one side in the mud on the sides of the banks, but the river is really clear. Here, the river They've widened it slightly to create this lovely little rapids, which is helping the diversity of the River Hogsmill, which many years ago had an almost drain-like appearance. It was all controlled, and they're doing a lot to um, make the Hogsmill River look much more natural. One of the problems, of course, during heavy rains in urban areas, particularly things like off-road parking, is when it rains, the water very quickly runs off into the rivers, problem with flooding and with turbidity. But even here, they're trying to make a difference with what we call sustainable drainage, just slowing down the, um, as the water drains down through the soil. Is it's by doing sustainable drainage, it helps the um, diversity of the river and prevents flooding. Still issue in certain areas when you get very heavy rains, the systems can't cope and basically the um, sewage systems overflow and end up in the river. But even there, they're trying to make a difference and it's really encouraging all the rivers like the Hogs Mill are much more healthy now than they used to be 20, 30 years ago. Now we're looking at the Kingston Road bridge, very busy road between Epsom and York going up to Tolworth and then Kingston. I'm still just in Epsom and York but basically this bridge marks the boundary between Epsom and York and Kingston and also between Surrey and Greater London. So you can probably hear all the cars behind me. What's really interesting here, just downstream here, what they've done here, they've put these stones in to create this series of rapids to add to the diversity of the River Hogsmill. And this is so encouraging. Part of the problems with the River Hogsmill in the past, there were various um, weirs where it's very difficult for things like common eels to migrate up through. And so they've been getting rid of all these barriers and putting in these sort of features, which really do make a difference to the flow of the river and the diversity and encourage things like the common eel and other fish to migrate upstream. Now a couple of miles further downstream on the River Hogsmill in Old Morden and although recently with the rains it was slightly turbid with the runoff from the London clay it is now quite clear again just stressing that as a chalk river it tends to be clear and it's somewhere along this stretch of the river that the pre-Raphaelite painter Sir John Robert Molas painted Ophelia. The painting Ophelia is from uh, Shakespeare's Hamlet and with pre-Raphaelite painters what they wanted to include was realistic natural landscapes. And just in case you cannot recall the painting Ophelia, here we are. And the model for Ophelia was a 19 year old Elizabeth Siddell. And she was actually painted laying in a bathtub. But the actual natural location in the painting is the river Hogsmill. And now from the painting of Ophelia to some modern art. This is actually underneath the railway bridge between Morden Manor and Tolworth. 
And so just to stress, although it's a really nice open space along the River Hogsmill, there are built up areas on both sides and Morden Manor Station is just a couple of minutes of walk away from this location. Here we are by the River Hogsmill once more, having to speak up because it's quite noisy because here the River Hogsmill on its way to Kingston goes under the very, very busy A3, which is the uh, London to Portsmouth Road. I'm now on the uh, lower part of the Hogsmill River at Elmbridge Meadow, and we're looking at a side tributary here from the Berylands Nature Reserve. And as I've been mentioning a number of times during my presentation, They've been trying to make the Hogsmill and the tributaries more natural and more diverse over the last few years. And the other thing they're planning to do is to reintroduce the water vault. Now, if you're familiar with Wind in the Willows and Ratty, Ratty is not a rat, he's a water vault. And they've really suffered from habitat destruction, tidying up rivers and introduction of mink. But what they're going to do here very soon is reintroduce the water vault. Lovely view of the River Hogsmill at Elmbridge Meadows with the reflection of the willows. What you can see here, some shallows and some islands of vegetation to create an eddy to give the river a more natural flow. And the Lower Hogsmill is quite a good place to look out for kingfishers, grey heron and also little egret. Uh, little egret's a recent arrival in the UK, used to be a vagrant or just an annual visitor. It, it started to appear in more numbers from about 1989 and first bred in Dorset in 1996 and doing very well now. Is obviously a lot of this is um, linked to climate change. However, it's also linked to the recovery from the persecution of egrets and birds during the Victorian era when feathers and bird plumes were very popular for hats and stopping this trade was a very good early example of girl power. I mentioned that the little egret started to increase in numbers in 1989. Well, a hundred years before that, in 1889, a lady called Emily Williamson set up the Society for the Protection of Birds to basically campaign against the barbaric trade in the plumes and feathers of birds, particularly things like the little egret. She managed to persuade Queen Victoria for uh, soldiers to stop using osprey plumes in their, on their hats. And in 1904, it had a royal charter and became the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds. And then finally, in 1922, the Import Importation of Plumage Prohibition Act came into force, thanks to Emily. So again, an early example of girl power. Now you've been hearing ringnet parakeets throughout my presentation, so now I would like to talk more about ringnet parakeets. I'm now back on the upper part of the River Hogsmill, very close to where I live, and in this lovely wintry landscape, you can see some crack willows. And it's our largest willow, and it's from the wood of the hybrid of the crack willow and the white willow, where you get cricket bats. I really like this spot, a lot of wildlife is attracted to this area. You can hear the cackling of the magpies, and you can also hear the ringnet parakeets. Now you've been hearing ringnet parakeets throughout my presentation and they're not native to the UK. But this spot around the River Hogs Mill and this part of Surrey and southwest London is a hot spot for ringnet parakeets. But how did they get here? So ringnet parakeets, also known as rose ring parakeets, they're not native to the UK. They're found in a strip of sub-Saharan Africa and also in the Indian subcontinent. So how can they survive? 
in our climate. Well, they're also found in the Himalayan foothills, so our climate is quite good for ringneck parakeets. One theory is that they escaped from the Blue Peter Garden in Western London in 1990. Another theory, a whole group escaped from an aviary after the Great Storm of 1987. And I talked about the Great Storm in the first part of my presentation. And before that Great Storm, a lot of fallen trees were tidied up. What's been really good since then, there were so many fallen trees, they left a lot to rot and that's really made a big difference to the diversity and some of those rotting trees are still here along the River Hogs Mill. But as for the theory that that's the rose ring parakeets escaped from Avery's after the great storm, incorrect. Yes, the late 80s was a time where they're very obvious but I can remember rose ring parakeets in the early 70s and a lovely theory related to the appearance in the early 70s is that it was down to Jimi Hendrix. Jimi Hendrix was wandering down Carnaby Street with two rose ring parakeets called Adam and Eve in a small cage and he let them go. Again, lovely theory, but incorrect. There's evidence of um, the parakeets appearing in the late, sorry, in the early 50s. And I love the theory. Here is the filming of the African Queen with Humphrey Bogard and Catherine Turner at the Shepperton Studios in 1951. This is in the right area in the home counties to the southwest of London and they are using rose ring parakeets and some of them escaped. So you can hear the parakeets calling in the crack willows. So the latest theory about how they became established. There's now evidence of parakeets appearing in the wild in 1930 then again in 1952 and this was linked to parrot fever is there's huge concerns about psittacosis so a pet owner just released the parakeets into the wild a sort of deliberate release rather than accidental release probably after the um, 1930 release they didn't survive but after the 1952 release they gradually increased Climate change may have played a role, but my guess is with the 1952 release, as they gradually increased, you also had more and more people feeding parakeets in their gardens. And it's this part of southwest London and Surrey is the hotspot, Bushy Park, Hampton Court Park, around Kingston. In fact, it's also known as the Kingston parakeet, but perhaps it's here on the river Hogsmill with the habitat and the nearby sub suburbs that they first became really established. So you've been hearing the call of the parakeets. What I'd like to do now is give you a close-up view of some of them. Here we have a couple of parakeets that appear to be checking out a nest hole. and just popped out say this is my spot obviously the wrong time of year for them to be breeding but they may be just checking out potential nesting sites I have a small group of parakeets here a couple of them been checking out nesting holes or interacting but what I would like to do is take you to a parakeet a roost. Now about 30 minutes after sunset I'm at the parakeet roost on Cable Mill Road in Kingston next to the River Hogs Mill. They're still coming in but there's huge numbers here. First of all how many parakeets are there in the UK? One estimation was 8,300 pairs but that's out of date. Another estimation is 31,000 individuals. I think even that is out of date. At Easter Rugby Club, there used to be a roost of 6,000. But I've no idea how many they are roosting here, but it is incredible.
here I'm back at the parakeet roost a couple of days later this is mid-afternoon so they haven't arrived yet I tried to find out how many roost here they haven't done a count yet but talk to someone about the Isha roost I mentioned apparently I haven't removed some of the trees now but at its peak it had 25,000 parakeets so the roost was next to the river Hogsmill and we're off Villiers Road and this is the post office depot what's well, very interesting these buildings here were part of Hawk aircraft this was the HQ of Hawk aircraft from 1920 and they went on to build the Hurricane and the Spitfire which made such a difference in the Second World War after the Second World War or around that time they became Hawker Siddeley and they went on to construct the first commercial jet airliner the Comet also the Trident and the Nimrod and now I want to talk about history a bit further back in time I'm now in Kingston very close to where the River Hogsmill comes out in the River Thames and this lovely old bridge, I've walked across it many times and looked down to see if I could see any fish like chub resting in the river. There's a bit too much flow today, but when there's less flow, there's a lovely little slack area here where the chub collect. Well, I never realised walking across this bridge so many times. Clatton Bridge was built around 1175, which makes it one of the oldest standing bridges in England. Now, I also mentioned that Kingston is named for the Saxon kings were crowned here where the River Hogsmill comes out on the River Thames. And they were crowned at the Coronation Stone. And as I pan round, here is the Coronation Stone. A bit of Saxon history, very complicated because there's various Saxon kingdoms and of course the Vikings, people may remember King Alfred and the Burning on the Cakes. He was the King of Wessex, based in Winchester, fighting all the Vikings. At the Coronation Stone between 899 and 978, they believe up to seven Saxon kings were crowned. We're not quite sure how many, because history is quite complicated. The names here, you can see Edward. Edward was the son of King Alfred. And then you have King Athelstan. How many people have heard of King Athelstan? the son of King Edward and the grandson of Alfred. He became King of Mercia in 924, but had to sort out some issues in Wessex. And once he had sorted out those issues, he was crowned here at the Coronation Stone in 925 as the King of Mercia and Wessex, so an Anglo-Saxon king. Then, two years later, in 927, he took York back from the Vikings and became the first King of England, King Athelstan. So now I'm coming towards the end of my journey on the River Hogsmill, it's where it comes out on the River Thames. Got Canada geese and mute swans here. This little conservation area, and as I pan further around, you've got the view across their attempts to home park home parks there part of Hampton Court and of course people will be very familiar with Hampton Court and Henry the eighth and Hampton Court is a bit further up river on the opposite side of the river Thames from the, where the river mole comes out and where I am is where the river Hogsmill comes out and if I pan further around you can see Kingston Bridge just upstream from where the River Hogsmill comes out in the River Thames in this lovely wall mural. If I pan around, we're looking upstream, up the River Thames towards Thames Ditton. It basically goes round a bend to Thames Ditton, then right round to Hampton Court. Now, I used to be in the Sea Scouts and we had a boat hut at Thames Ditton. And basically my experience messing around in boats and on Zodiac is all thanks to my time in the Sea Scouts on the River Thames. What amuses me even today 
when I'm on a boat or on a ship and someone hasn't tied a knot correctly, I get really frustrated. I do have one last amusing story to tell of my time in the uh, Sea Scouts. Oh, also notice my, with all the wind, my hair is sticking up a bit like a macaroni penguin. But yes, in my time in the Sea Scouts, when you first joined, you had to wear a life jacket until you could swim the width of the river. I was very proud, I very quickly passed the test. And I can remember phoning home afterwards to my father and saying, Dad, I did it, I swam the width, I don't have to wear a life jacket. And I didn't go to hospital. <laughs> you may think, what? Well, the reason for this is a lot of scouts struggled to get across. They saw the lots of water. And in those days, in the 60s, the river was so badly polluted, some ended up going to hospital. So health and safety is rather different today. Of course, what's really good news, the river is much cleaner today, both the River Thames and the River Hogsmill. So I do hope you've enjoyed my tour along the River Hogsmill, enjoying the wildlife, the history and the locations. And do remember, although we are restricted with travelling at the moment, it is a real opportunity to explore and discover your local open spaces and discover more about the wildlife locations and the history. Thank you.